the Apostles' Creed, and if you are able to, I'd ask that you stand uh, as we uh, affirm uh, in unison uh, these essentials of our faith. I remind you that these words uh, that we that we say here, first of all, that there's no, nothing special to them. There's not, it's not like some magic incantation. Uh, second of all, that if you go looking for them in Scripture, you're not going to find them. Uh, this was a, a creed uh, that uh, the um, uh, is a is a associated uh, to the apostles with regard to trying to come up with summaries, um, uh, essential um, uh, 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 beliefs uh, with regard to the Christian faith. So if you believe this, please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, our next <coughs> hymn uh, is really close to the uh, Sunday School song that we sang. Actually, it was on the other side of the, of the book, and I was actually going to make a comment about that, but I'm glad I didn't since we're going to sing it now. So number 499, Sunshine in My Soul. First, second, and last. First, second, and last. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we do come to you this morning. We thank you for the blessings that you do give to us now. We thank you for those promises that uh, we will experience sometime in the future. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your obedient work. We thank you for the way in which you have provided and made that bridge that we may be reconciled to the Father. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, and we ask that that same Holy Spirit that raised you from the grave, that that same Holy Spirit would be with us now. Guide us, direct us, help us to give you all the honor and glory that you were due, such that you may be pleased with our worship. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm really glad that it's not raining out there. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. You know, sometimes we, 
uh, and, and we and I, I wasn't even involved in picking out the songs. Uh, uh, usually Sadira does that, and uh, sometimes uh, Rick uh, is, is helping her and or we, 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 we pick them on the fly uh, if we haven't had um, um, practice like we didn't have the week before. But uh, um, of course, it didn't say that there's sunshine outside. It just said that there's sunshine in our soul today. So even if it is raining outside, we can still be joyful and have sunshine in our soul. But uh, it, uh, it's, it's nicer that it's nice out there today, even though it's a little cold, uh, but um, that's all good. Well, welcome. Welcome to Green's Chapel. Thank you for choosing uh, to worship with us today. Um, I, I don't say this all the time. It's actually, it's been a little while since I've said it, but uh, you have a choice. Um, you have a choice about uh, where you're going to worship, and you have a choice of if you're going to worship. Uh, and uh, as uh, believers in Christ who have uh, professed uh, their uh, faith in Christ, um, uh, there is a target on our backs that seeks to keep us away from church uh, every Sunday uh, and keep us away from our Bible every single day of the week uh, and to keep us away from our relationship with Christ every minute of the day. Uh, and so it is a battle uh, in, in that, uh, that we face daily uh, in which uh, we, we cannot rely on our laurels from the day before uh, and uh, we have to uh, remake those same, th th those same decisions uh, and uh, grow in faith each and every, every, every single day. So I am I'm grateful uh, for each of you and for each of you being here today. If you look on the inside of your bulletin there, you'll see uh, uh, kind of our, our normal structure. We will uh, plan on having the choir practice later on today at 4. Uh, we are uh, continuing uh, in our uh, Wednesday morning Bible study going over uh, the English translations of the Bible uh, with regard to why there are so many, um, why are they different, uh, when did they come about, uh, which one might be the the, the best one, I won't say the right one, maybe the best one for us at, a, at one time or another in our lives. Uh, and and there, I have made some recommendations, at least on one, to avoid at all costs. Um, but um, uh, we, are, we are continuing uh, with that particular Bible study. Uh, on Wednesday, we invite all uh, to be able to come in to join us there. Um, you, uh, this is, um, uh, we are now into uh, the Lent season, the, the, the six weeks uh, prior to uh, uh, the Resurrection Sunday celebration uh, that we will be uh, celebrating here in six weeks. Uh, and so uh, Sadira has a, uh, a nice uh, little message for us there on the back. Um, you will also uh, see that we are celebrating some birthdays or recognizing um, the anniversaries of birthdays uh, this week. Uh, we have Mary Phoebus, uh, which uh, is today, um, which we will embarrass her in just a moment. Um, we have uh, Wade Gilliland, uh, who is later this week, and then we are also remembering Gavin. Um, whose birthday would also have been this week as well. Um, so we can go ahead and embarrass Mary, so please join me as we do so. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And God bless you, Miss Mary. Have anything you want to tell us? Awesome. Congratu Congratulations. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. God does, uh, I mean, it's amazing. You know, it, every single life is indeed a miracle. Uh, and uh, we are certainly most gracious uh, and grateful for uh, the life that we have and for uh, God bringing new life into our families as well. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other announcements uh, that we need to be bringing to the attention of the congregation? No. Okay. With that, we will continue our worship. Uh, our next hymn uh, is uh, number 515, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. And we're going to sing verses. We'll sing all of them. All of them. <laughs> Oh, 
If you will, turn one more time to the back of your hymnal for our response to reading today, which is number 657. The title of it is Faithfulness. You'll find it there on the right-hand page, left-hand column near the bottom. Uh, I will read uh, these passages that are uh, not in bold, and uh, please, if you can, respond in unison to those that are in bold. Faithfulness. Who, then, is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant who his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous Naaman, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And ye, I'm sorry, and if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is yours own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Amen. Uh, I would remind you that we continue to leave the offering plate in the back in the vestibule there. Uh, you can certainly, if you haven't uh, and, need, and would like to, uh, you can put your tithes and or offerings in there uh, at, the, at the end of the service. Uh, at this time, uh, the choir... Uh, we'll go ahead and perform the special. Uh, this is the He is Holy medley.
go into the, uh, the praise and prayer time here in just a moment, but uh, I wanted to go ahead and uh, have something for everybody to, um, to have a praise item for this morning. Um, uh, some of you, hopefully all of you, uh, are, have been able to meet uh, Robert and Tammy and the two girls. Uh, and over the last several weeks, uh, I have met with, uh, with, with all of them. Uh, Karen has been uh, teaching uh, the girls uh, with regard to some, some stuff in our confession of faith, but also uh, in the, uh, the um, uh, teenager version of the Bible study that goes along with the same um, lessons that we have. Uh, and Robert and Tammy and the girls have uh, expressed an interest to join our church. Uh, and so just to remind you, there are two ways uh, in which someone can become a member uh, of um, the chapel, but uh, any kind of question in church. Uh, one is through profession of faith. Uh, and uh, that is uh, an, an, an act, a public act, uh, where the person uh, publicly professes Faith in Christ. Uh, there's some some words here in our Confession of Faith and uh, in, in our Constitution um, that we use uh, to go ahead and um, make sure that we cover all the bases, if you will, with regard to what that means uh, in, in terms of giving a public profession of faith. Uh, the second way is through transfer of letter. A transfer of letter is when you are a member of another church, uh, and our uh, understanding and our interpretation is that you cannot become a member of that other church unless you can be a public profession of faith there. So if you are already a member of another church and you wish to leave that church for whatever reason, maybe you leave, maybe the, the church is disbanded, whatever the reason is, and become a member of our church, we do not make you, quote, do another profession of faith. Okay? Well, it turns out that uh, Robert currently is not a member of a church anywhere, but uh, the girls and Tammy, uh, they have been uh, a member of Nectar Missionary Baptist? Methodist Church. Um, uh, they have contacted them and requested a, a letter uh, stating that, uh, that they wish to go ahead and transfer the membership from that church to our church. We don't have that letter yet. But we're not going to stop them from becoming members. Um, so what we are going to do, because uh, I've already talked to them about this as well, so just so you know, I'm not putting them on the spot or anything. Um, what we are going to do is all four of them are going to come up here, and they're all going to make a profession of faith, public profession of faith here. Uh, and then uh, once they have done that, then uh, I will uh, basically establish a call meeting of our session. Um, you, the church uh, members themselves, you actually don't have the power. Uh, to accept members into the into the church, uh, it's a responsibility uh, of the, the session to do so. So we will have an impromptu call session uh, of the. You don't have to go anywhere. Um, we'll have an impromptu call session uh, or call meeting of the session. Uh, I will have an opening prayer. Uh, I will entertain motions. Uh, and, and just so you know, uh, you're not an elder on session. So if, well, if you're not an elder on session, you really can't speak or anything. But the elders will go ahead and go through a process here, uh, and uh, we will hopefully uh, accept uh, this family uh, that has uh, that, that God has brought to us, um, uh, and they're very excited to be here. Uh, we, I know, at least I've been very excited, and they have felt your excitement uh, as well over the past several months in terms of in terms of their being here. So, without any, any further ado, let me go ahead and ask uh, the Morris family to come up. So, come on up, please. Let me stand right up there. All right, so Robert and Tammy, um, Tiffany and Cheyenne, uh, don't be, don't be afraid. You're not going to embarrass yourself. You're not going to embarrass yourself, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to try to embarrass anybody either. Um, we, we've already talked about all this. Uh, just so you know, uh, I am, uh, in, in terms of making a profession of faith, one of the responsibilities of the pastor is to uh, basically uh, investigate their salvation experience. Uh, to to get a sense of how God went ahead and saved them, uh, and to make sure that that seems like uh, that it is compatible with our understanding of what a salvation experience would be like. I have met with them. I have talked with them. I am completely satisfied that God has done a work in their lives that they are are now new creations in Christ. And so what I'm going to do again, uh, don't be don't be nervous. Uh, we actually went over all these questions with them a couple weeks ago, so there's no surprises here. But it has been a couple of weeks. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the question, and then if you can, insincerely, uh, either say I do or yes, okay? All right, so the first question is, and, and as I'm doing this, you might, uh, you might just hear it as well, hopefully you can hear me, hear it as well, and, and, and not necessarily to, uh, uh, to challenge your own uh, profession of faith, but just maybe as a reminder in terms of some of these things that, that, that we hold very dear, uh, that is the, the, the essential aspects of what it means to become a believer in Christ. So, first question. Do you repent of your sin and believe Jesus Christ to be your Savior and the Lord of your life? Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the inspired Word of God, the source of authority for faith and practice, and will you read and study them for guidance in living the Christian life? Okay, good. So far, so good. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this church by participating in worship, sharing in its ministry of witness and service, Supporting the government of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church and, and loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Excellent. Will you strive to overcome temptation and weakness, grow in knowledge and grace, and practice love in all relationships, being strengthened in your personal discipleship by your life in the community of faith? Okay. This is the last one. Do you promise to be a good steward of the life, talents, time, and money which God has entrusted to you, giving of these gifts to the church? All right. Just as a reminder, um, each of these four people here are already saved. Okay? Each of them have, have already previously made a profession of faith. Because we don't have a, quote, letter uh, in terms of them being a recognized member of another church. Um, that's why we went through this particular process because they really want to become, they want to become members a couple weeks ago, but we want to give the process a chance to work out as well. Um, and so you have now heard their public profession in terms of what they believe, and hopefully that aligns with what you believe as well. It's not in the confession of faith, um, but one of the things that, that, um, that, 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 that they, they did at our, at our old church that I thought was really a good little practice is, at this point, I'm going to ask you, will you accept these four people into this church? Will you love them? Will you support them? Will you pray for them? Will you minister with them? Will you love them as though they have been here even as long as you have been? Thank you. All right. So at this point, we're going to have a call session meeting. Uh, I'm going to say a quick little prayer here, and then I'm going to open the floor for a motion uh, that we, that we uh, accept uh, these four uh, believers in Christ as members of the Christian chapel. So let's pray. Father God, we come to you this, today. We're very grateful, very thankful for what you have done in their lives and what you're doing in the life of this church. Uh, may they come alongside us, and may we undergird them as well as you use all of us in the ministry here in, in this particular area. We ask that your Holy Spirit would abide here with us as we go through this very short meeting. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, elders and elders only. Uh, do I hear a motion uh, to uh, accept Robert, Tammy, Cheyenne, and Tiffany as full-fledged members of Green's Chapel? Motion. Uh, there's a motion. motion to uh, not only extend that motion, but also to uh, identify to uh, Tammy, Tiffany, Cheyenne, and Robert that each one of y'all will have the same privilege and responsibility as any member of the church now. So I'm on, uh, I don't know if Tommy made that motion, but uh, I'm going to second his motion okay. that uh, we accept the members of the church. Excellent. Thank you. All right, elders, uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, uh, all, all in favor of accepting uh, these four uh, believers in Christ as members having full uh, privileges uh, and responsibilities within Green Chapel say aye. Aye. Everybody said aye, so there can't be any nays. Uh, so the motion passes. Uh, so 
at the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come up and hug them and you can go ahead and thank them and just uh, express your love to them. Uh, but at this point, please just give them a round of applause and we thank you. <laughs> Okay, that's right. So, all right, yeah, all right. So, yeah, so Robert, you know, he, he just reminded me, he just recovered from COVID here a couple of days so actually Wednesday. So, um, you can still go ahead and, 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 and love on them and thank them, but just, just from a distance, okay? <laughs> all right. So, go ahead. Thank you so much. And welcome. Welcome to Lee's Chapel. We are thrilled to have you, for sure. All right. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about um, uh, some of the people that I've contacted and some of the ministry that I've done this past week. So um, uh, I, I just remind you that uh, Viola, uh, uh, she, she continues to struggle right now, uh, not necessarily so much uh, with pain, although I'm sure that that's still a little bit uh, of, of, of uh, uh, a, a problem for her, but uh, much more so with discouragement. Uh, and um, I talked with her for, for a good little while, um, and all of you who know her know that that is not typical of Viola. Um, um, I've, I've, I've made some, some suggestions to her in terms of maybe some things that she might be able to pursue. There are some medical things that are kind of in, in the works right now as well. But I would just encourage all of you to go ahead and continue to pray for Viola, uh, as well as if you get a chance, just go ahead and give her a call or drop her a card or a text message, whatever it is, whatever facilities you have uh, with her. And if you don't know her contact information, you can contact me. Just contact somebody here in the church uh, more than likely they will have that contact information as well. Uh, I also uh, went and visited with Maria. Maria had that stomach virus. Uh, she is over that now. Uh, she's continuing to have uh, physical and occupational therapy come to her home there, uh, primarily for her neck uh, and uh, strengthening her neck. She's got some exercises and uh, some things that they have given her to go ahead and do as well. And she seems to be uh, doing much better. I also brought communion for her as, uh, uh, as well, and we celebrated that. So. So um, she uh, is hoping uh, to get back to church as soon as, as soon as she can, as well as to the Wednesday morning Bible study. So I uh, want to extend that to you as also. Also, um, Mark, uh, and uh, as, you, as you can see, Mark and Mary are not here today. Um, I chatted uh, with Mark yesterday. Um, he, he and Mary think that they might have some uh, new strain of COVID. Um, and so uh, I'm not exactly sure what steps they've taken at this point, uh, but I know that Mark is not feeling well. He's not sounding very well right now also. Uh, so please continue to keep uh, both Mark and Mary uh, in, your, in your prayers also. Um, we're very grateful that um, Robert um, has uh, recovered from COVID and, and, and any others um, that um, uh, you may know, have, know that also have either that or some other ailments. Um, uh, are there other are there other praise items or prayer requests that we can either uh, bring updates or new to the congregation at this time? Hey, everybody got silent. <laughs> yes. I was going to say when we were talking the other night, we were talking about Baby and Branch. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, praise God for that. For those of you that may, may not remember, that's the grand uh, baby of um, that Tommy and Alma have been faithful to bring up to us, in, including issues that Ron has had as well. Uh, that was born, had to have that surgery uh, there for her jaw. Uh, was, it was uh, down at Children's Hospital for quite some time, even before uh, the holidays and being able to come home and all that. So uh, at this point, they have taken the feeding tube out, which, which they weren't actually using the, uh, recently, um, but uh, also taken the screw out of her jaw as well. So that's got to, uh, that's got to just uh, be a joyful time, not only for the parents, but for the grandparents as well. So uh, very grateful for that. Miss Carolyn, I think you have a praise item. Uh, I've been experiencing a headache that was different, and uh, because of the cancer, I was worried about it. So I had an MRI, and Dr. Lackenhoff said everything's normal. Amen. All right. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Any others? Lots of unspoken. That's fine. 
God knows our hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Father God, we do come to you today. We thank you. We thank you for answered prayers, especially those that uh, go along the, 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 the paths or the, the means in which uh, we might want. We, uh, we understand that uh, all, all the things that happen in this life are not necessarily going to go the way that we want, but we, we do um, stand upon the, 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 the foundation that you are good, you are just, you are loving, you are gracious, uh, and uh, that you are perfect. And so uh, we trust uh, that your will is superior uh, to ours uh, and that uh, the day will come, uh, whether it's, uh, it, it may not be in this particular lifetime, but the day will come where we, we will have a profound understanding with regard to the ways in which you answered various prayers uh, here, uh, the way in which you've used each of us, uh, the way in which uh, our lives um, were part of your plan uh, with regard to the lives of others as well. Uh, Father, we, we thank you for healing that you have brought. We thank you for Miss Martha being back with us and being able to worship again. We thank you for uh, Robert's healing from uh, the COVID that he had. We pray for Mark and Mary, Lord, that regardless of what they have, that uh, either, either medication uh, and or your healing touch will bring comfort and healing to them. Father, I thank you even for uh, Karen and, and my friend there in Houston uh, who's had this surgery. Uh, that she is continuing to recover there. Father, that you would be with her, strengthening her also. Father, for uh, little um, Anne Francis and for uh, the family there, we are grateful for uh, just those uh, uh, people that you have placed uh, in her path uh, that have enabled her uh, to, to be where she is right now today and to be able to enjoy um, a, a, a long and full life. Father, for new life, uh, that is on its way. We thank you for that as well. Uh, Father, we, 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 we pray for those that are not with us today uh, for one reason or another that, uh, again, you would be with them. Uh, Father, that uh, you would um, allow them uh, to be able to come and to join uh, us and to worship with us. Father, we thank you for Robert and Tammy and Cheyenne and Tiffany. We thank you for the work that you're doing for uh, those new people that you're bringing here to Green's Chapel. We thank you uh, that uh, they will be able to step in uh, and to uh, uh, make their uh, mark um, through your will and through the giftings that you have given to them um, here, not only in this church, but more in, uh, in, in specifically with regard to this community. Um, and we thank you for them and we thank you for others that you are bringing as well. May we be good stewards, even as we saw in our responsive reading today, uh, of those most important gifts uh, that you have given to us, that you have entrusted to us, which certainly is the souls of men and women. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you'll turn to your Bibles, uh, to the Gospel of Mark, uh, we're going to be looking at um, uh, three verses here uh, in uh, chapter 8, starting with verse 31 and completing in verse 33. Uh, and uh, I would just remind you that I typically, which I will also do today, I will read the passage first and I will read from the King James translation, and then as I go through the rest of the message, I will be uh, referring back to the ESV. Uh, remind you also that this is the Word of God, uh, that even as we saw or heard in our choir special today, that we are indeed standing on holy ground. Uh, and um, I, I know that you know that and are aware of it, and certainly as a pastor who is preaching the Word of God, I am uh, ever um, cognizant uh, of the importance uh, in being a faithful uh, teacher and proclaimer of that word. Uh, and all of us have a responsibility to then to uh, have open hearts and minds uh, to God and to his word. So starting in verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of God must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Let's pray. Father God, I do pray that the power of the cross, the power of your Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel of Christ, 
is proclaimed faithfully and that your faithful people here, your servants, would hear, accept, and treasure it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, in six weeks, we will be celebrating uh, the anniversary of the greatest event in all of history. It will be on March 31st, and it will have nothing to do with the college basketball or March Madness tournament. It will have nothing to do with the 2024 season of Major League Baseball, having just begun four days earlier. It will have nothing to do with the college football spring practice games getting ramped up later that week. It will have nothing to do with the primaries of the 2024 U.S. election, regardless of which candidates are still in and which have since dropped out. It will have nothing to do with whether or not the Federal Reserve has cut, raised, or maintained the interest rate it charges on loans from the Federal Reserve Bank. It will have nothing to do with the rate of inflation, the price of gas, or how much we pay for a pound of hamburger. It will have nothing to do with the war in Ukraine, the ongoing battle between Israel and Hamas, or whether or not China has invaded Taiwan. It will have nothing to do with who won the Oscar for Best Picture, Best Actor, or Best Actress. In six weeks, we will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God and God himself, who became the perfect atonement of sin, making a way for every man, woman, and child to be reconciled to the Father, for those who sincerely put their entire faith and trust in Jesus and his work on the cross. The resurrection is the proof that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice, taking upon himself the judgment for our sins, and providing the one and only way in which our sins are permanently forgiven, giving us renewed fellowship and communion with God, not only in this life, but for all eternity. That, my fellow brothers and sisters, is what Jesus did for us. The free gift of eternal salvation that God made possible for us nearly 2,000 years ago is the event, the event that you and I will be talking about, singing about, and tirelessly giving thanks to God about through all eternity. Back in January, I preached a sermon from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul is reminding the infant church there in Corinth of the power and wisdom of God, specifically through the cross of Christ versus the power and wisdom of mankind and the world. He went on to note at least two stumbling blocks in people that prevent them from accepting the free gift of salvation God offers through the cross. Signs, as required by the Jews, and wisdom as required by the Greeks. I'm not going to repeat that sermon here now, but one of the most important points that Paul was trying to get across to them and to us is that Christ's crucifixion on the cross is in direct contrast and opposition to the ways and the minds of mankind, specifically our perception of our own innate wisdom and power Yet through the cross, God, in fact, achieved what man's wisdom and power are incapable of doing, securing our deliverance from both the penalty and the power of sin in our lives. And that is why Paul then was able to tell them in that letter with regard to his preaching of the gospel, he says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of of God. The folly or foolishness of the cross has been a stumbling block well before it became one in our day and time. In our Wednesday morning Bible study of Isaiah chapter 53, the fourth song in Isaiah describing God's servant, we saw how even the Jews during Isaiah's day had difficulty with God's prophetic word regarding the life and ministry of the Messiah that God was going to provide. Specifically, they had great difficulty in being able to accept a Messiah who would endure great suffering. And not because of anything he had done, but because of what they, in fact, had done. God goes on to tell them in that fourth servant song that although the Messiah would die, having interceded for the transgressions and borne the sins of many, that somehow, somehow, his days would be prolonged and he would see his offspring. Isaiah prophesies that eventually some would come to see and understand, but not necessarily all, and not necessarily as it was happening. 
In our scripture passage for today here in the Gospel of Mark, we are more than two years into Jesus' public ministry and getting close to when he will head towards Jerusalem for his final Passover celebration. Jesus has recently fed a crowd of 4,000 using just seven loaves of bread and a few small fish and having seven full baskets left over. To the Pharisees who came to argue with him, he has denied their request to give them a sign affirming his identity and his ministry. He has healed a blind man who was brought to him by some of the people in Bethsaida, having done so outside the village in more of a private setting, and then directed the newly healed man to go home without going back through the village for people to see that he had been healed. On the way to Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples who the various people they were coming into contact with thought that he was. They told him some thought he was John the Baptist, others thought he was Elijah, and still others thought he was another prophet. When Jesus asked them what they thought or who they thought he was, Peter seems to answer for the twelve, confessing that he is the Christ, the Messiah, that God had promised. After affirming this revelation to Peter from God, Jesus then specifically tells the twelve not to tell anyone who he is. Strange, isn't it? God has just revealed that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus has confirmed it, yet he doesn't want them to tell anyone. Why would Jesus not want them to tell anyone? In other Gospels, in similar, somewhat similar situation, Jesus tells them and other people that it is not yet time for his identity to be made known as his ministry is still in progress. Here, that's partially true, but the next three verses are going to give us greater insight into why Jesus is not ready for the 12 to proclaim who he is. Look at verse 31, where Mark writes, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. Why are they not ready to tell anyone? Because although the twelve now know Jesus is the Messiah, even they don't have a proper understanding of what that means. And if they were now to go and tell others, they would be unable to effectively communicate Jesus' true mission, and in so doing, they would be perpetuating a false hope that Jesus was not there to fulfill. As many, if not all of you know, the Jews at that time were expecting the Messiah to be a divinely anointed leader who, like Moses or Joshua, the judges or the kings of the Old Testament, would liberate the Jewish people from their oppression under the Romans and restore the glory and reign of the Jewish throne and kingdom. That, however, was not the correct understanding of what God promised in his Messiah. As I alluded to earlier, Isaiah in particular had prophesied that the Messiah would be a suffering Messiah. In fact, Isaiah goes even deeper, proclaiming that it was the will of God himself that the Messiah was to suffer. Mark tells us here in verse 31 that Jesus begins to bring this understanding to the 12, noting specifically that the Son of Man was going to suffer many things, that he would be rejected by the Jewish religious leaders, that he would eventually be killed, and that in three days he would rise again. In accordance then with Isaiah's prophecy, Jesus is teaching that all this must occur, implying that it is God's divine will. Now you can see then how Jesus' teaching doesn't fit at all with what his disciples were expecting. And that's why he had told them back in verse 30, not to tell anyone yet who he was. As we are about to see in the next verse, this was obviously a huge shock to the 12. They had been with Jesus now for over two years. They had seen him do amazing things. Prior to Peter's confession, they were even convinced that God himself had sent him. For only by the power of God would he have been able to do some of the things that he had done. They were undoubtedly tired and frustrated with being oppressed by the Romans. 
God had just revealed to them that Jesus was, in fact, the long-promised Messiah. And now Jesus was telling them that he was not the Messiah that they were looking for. Maybe you can hear their thoughts. Surely they were thinking there's some kind of mistake here. Surely God was finally going to rescue them, restore them, and reside with them again. Surely that's what the prophets proclaimed and wrote about in the Old Testament. Surely they're not going to have to continue to live under the oppression of the Roman Empire, paying taxes to Caesar, following the commands of the Roman soldiers, and watching their countrymen being crucified whenever the Roman authorities dictated it. Surely the Messiah was going to exert his authority and power over all the evil and corruption that was taking place there in Israel and make them answer to him. Right? Wrong. Take a look at verse 32. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Unlike perhaps the way it was written by the prophets in the Old Testament, and unlike perhaps even some of the indirect ways that Jesus may have taught them in the previous two years, the mission of the Messiah as a suffering servant was now made crystal clear to them. Now Mark doesn't go into a lot of detail here, but it's likely that Jesus did even stating how he would no longer be avoiding, avoiding his enemies, rather than them having to come look for him in the countryside and escaping whenever he wished, he was going to go right into Jerusalem, where he would be easy to find and wouldn't even attempt to avoid or evade them. Jesus may not have gone into all the details regarding how he was going to suffer, but we can see that Jesus told the twelve enough that Peter, was pretty, that Peter had pretty much had enough of this nonsense and takes Jesus aside to correct him. Mark doesn't record what was said, although Matthew does in his gospel. But what is clear is that Peter and the other disciples completely understood what Jesus was communicating to them regarding the suffering Messiah. They didn't like it. And if it was up to them, they weren't going to allow it to happen. So, as Peter is correcting Jesus, Jesus interrupts him. And we read in verse 33, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. There's a great warning and great teaching for us here in this verse. First of all, we need to recognize at all times that Jesus is Lord and God, and we are not. To that end, we do not have the right, the power, or the authority to correct or rebuke Jesus. When and if we do, we should count on Jesus setting us straight. Although Peter may have been trying to rebuke Jesus somewhat privately, Jesus quickly turned and arranged for Peter and the other 11 to know that Peter was completely out of line, as were the other 11 in their thoughts and attitudes. Jesus will not be told who he is or what he is or what he is not to do. Dismissing or rejecting Jesus' teaching, distorting his character, or misinterpreting his intentions will not be tolerated and should be expected to be corrected. Those actions and those attitudes are clearly representative of the devil and have no place in God's plans or his kingdom. Second, God's plans and ways are obviously not always our plans and ways. Because of that, we need to take great care, extreme care, in hearing, listening, and understanding what God tells us, specifically through his word and by the power of the Holy Spirit, to illuminate God's truths to us. After being with Jesus for over two years, these men had an astonishingly erroneous understanding of who he was and what he was doing. 
They were not able to see and understand the importance of what Jesus was called to do in being the perfect sacrificial blood sacrifice that we needed. What they saw was unnecessary pain and suffering, humiliation, shame, and death. In fact, they seem to have completely missed the part that Jesus said about being raised three days after his death. To them, a dead Messiah was nothing but a martyr, noble in deed and action, but dead and powerless just the same. Sadly, almost 2,000 years later, people are still confused as to who Jesus is, what he taught, what he did, and why it was so important. At the root of this confusion and misunderstanding is sin, a sinful nature that is, along with an acute blindness to the problem of sin in our lives. I know I've said this numerous times in the Wednesday morning Bible study as well as in our Sunday school lesson, but one of the problems we all suffer from, believer and non-believer alike, is the way in which we minimize sin. The believer acknowledges that they are a sinner, that sin separates us from God, that they cannot save themselves, and that Jesus' atonement is the only way in which we are made righteous before the Father. Still, as God is busy transforming us into his son's image, it can be difficult even for us to fully comprehend the enormous magnitude and destructiveness of even a little white lie. On the other hand, the non-believer doesn't even acknowledge sin as being a problem. And where there is no problem, there is no need for a solution. Hence, unconfessed and unrepented sin is what makes the non-believer blind. Blind to their need for a savior, blind to Jesus' work on the cross, and completely deaf to the hearing of the gospel. They reject the idea or even the implication that there is a moral law giver, that there is one who can and must judge according to that moral law. As a result, they instead find fault with the judge instead of the one being judged. In short, if they even acknowledge God at all, they make him into the image they desire, forcing him to accept their truths and their ways and then proclaim that false God to the rest of the world. Jesus was clear. He was clear to his disciples of who he was, what his mission and ministry was. He corrected them in their earthly thinking, not to hurt or to weaken them, but to build and strengthen them, both in understanding and then going on to proclaiming God's true plan of salvation. There are too many people out there today confused about who Jesus really is, what he did during his first coming, and what he will do in his second. There are too many people who are looking into God's word, not liking what they see or read, seek to correct God in the error of his ways, and then proclaim their distorted truth to all who will listen. To all those who are so blind and deaf, Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. For man's ways of thinking are not those of God and are completely powerless and destructive. For God has purposely used the folly of man's perceived wisdom and the foolishness of the cross to accomplish what we truly needed and what only he could do. And when Jesus succeeded in his sacrifice and atonement on the cross, when his body was buried in a tomb to decay and return to the dust, God raised him from the grave, exalted him at his mighty right hand side, where he waits now to bring his final judgment to a sinful world before transforming it into the new heaven and the new earth that he has promised. The true character and nature of Jesus, along with his destiny with the cross, is what we needed even if it wasn't what we wanted. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for his ways, his plans, and his purposes. May we truly know them, accept them, and proclaim them, and may he be glorified and honored when we do. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, forgive us for any misunderstandings, misperceptions, even distortions that we here may have regarding your nature, your character, your deity, your plans, your purposes, your promises. Forgive us. Help to illuminate in our lives the truth, your truth, that it may, it may become the truth in our life as well. Father, Father, may we acknowledge these misunderstandings, use us in love to be able to bring forth your truth so that others too may come to the saving knowledge of Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they too may grow in discipleship, that they too may become your servants, that they too may become your instruments to bring forth your will, your kingdom, and not that of man. Father, we thank you for the corrections. We thank you for the discipline that you give to us. We thank you for the gift that we share and experience now and the treasures that you have promised that we are still yet to experience. We thank you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is, I believe, 306. Jesus saves. First verse.